So let's move on to the second part of our um, study session. So focused on academic learning and recovery support. So Dr. Swift, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, we have with us this evening uh, Ms. Don Linden and Mr. Kevin Carr. We do have uh, some of our team joining us from remote. Uh, this presentation uh, was with Performance Committee uh, just a while back, and it really covers uh, how we are responding to students and their needs around academic recovery, uh, learning and academic recovery. Uh, Ms. Linden. Good evening, everyone. Trustees, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for this opportunity. And I have to say our work today in talking first about an overall academic recovery um, presentation and then following this, a middle school intervention focus, really do, it is the yin and the yang to the SEL work that we just heard about from our previous colleagues. So um, it's a pleasure to share with you how the academic work in a multi-tiered system of support uh, works for us. So I am joined tonight by my partner and co-leader of teaching and learning, Executive Director Kevin Carr. And in short order, you're going to see some members of our elementary team coming on screen. And it is my great pleasure to introduce these fine individuals. So I think I'll start with the top left, which happens to be Emily Wark. You want to you want to wave? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we have Huda Harajli on the right. You guys are like the Brady Bunch right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then far right, Kristen Smith and Tony Stam and Natalie DePascal. So uh, each of them has a really important part of our presentation tonight, but I know it's late, so we're going to get right to the meat of it and dig right in. Um, but please do pause when you have questions. We're ready for those and anxious to have this conversation with you tonight. And Ms. So. Linden, just generally, these are support professionals for math and for literacy correct. and for English second language students. That's correct. Have I missed any important roles uh, No, there? you have not. Okay, yeah. very and they good. Will, they will speak a little bit to this through the presentation as well. So um, I think as an introduction, as Mr. Cluley is bringing up our presentation slides, um, we do want to say that, you know, tonight you're going to hear about some important elements of recovery and intervention. Um, they are in place in many of our buildings. There, there are always nuances and inconsistencies that are natural when you work with 32 different schools and different communities. But our job tonight is to share with you that overview. Um, but I think it's really important to also state that we are, have the very good fortune of a very highly skilled and talented teaching force. And they are the power behind the wheels of this system. And I just would be remiss if I didn't thank our team every time I have the opportunity here at yes. the podium. Um, we also have highly skilled instructional leaders, administrators at the building level, and you just saw some at the district level as well, who are working tirelessly. Um, we know that the recovery process is a long game. It's a marathon. It's certainly not a sprint. Um, COVID had an impact, and we were in that space for quite a while. So even though we've emerged, we've emerged with lots of need. You just heard about those needs from an SEL perspective, and the academic side is no different. So... Um, you're gonna hear about some of those important pieces, but uh, just like Dr. Hayward shared in the beginning of her presentation, we are never done, we, are, we have never arrived, our improvement work continues and it's ongoing. So every time we tackle one piece, we're on to the next and the next and we're constantly monitoring. So tonight we're gonna to share with you um, a few of the bullets here. So we're gonna talk about professional learning and how we support our teachers, that highly skilled teaching force that cares deeply about our students. We're gonna talk about how we diagnose, how we screen, but also uh, as we do that, we're gonna to point to the need to refine that process repeatedly. We have to get to a place where we're getting great data and meaningful data and effective data. We're gonna talk about how we use our time and, and those learning outcomes through that time. And probably most importantly is we will not intervene our way out of this issue of getting our students to where they need to be. It's going to take a tier one approach. It's gonna take partnerships. So we're gonna talk about that as well. All right, so uh, in much the same way our SEL team shared their data and their process, we're gonna look first uh, tonight just at the top four. 
So um, the bottom three pieces we'll touch on here and there, uh, but we're going to focus our attention on the top four. This should look familiar to you, trustees. This is our framework for equitable instruction. It's aspirational, and it shows uh, the many ways that we try to refine education and the experiences our students have. So we have four corners of our work with the dignity of our students at the center. They are the heartbeat of this work in the center. Um, top left, really refining our instruction so that uh, students are exposed to multiple and diverse cultures, that they see themselves in the learning, and most importantly, that they are celebrated and affirmed and that they can build their own identities within our system. That's really important to us. So that work, of course, is ongoing. Um, shifting over to the right, you'll see universally designed instruction. This is instruction where every single student has a place. Every single student has an entry point to the learning. Every single student has an opportunity to access that learning in the ways that work best for them. And every single student has a way to share their learning back. Um, so that's, that's another really ongoing element for us. The bottom right, um, Hara Harajli, our EL coordinator for the district, um, has really been leading some exceptional work already. Uh, in developing our entire teaching staff, including our EL teams, but this is in instruction with linguistic and academic accommodations. So making sure that our students who are learning the English language have those supports and scaffolds to be successful. Here's the great thing though, those same strategies that work for students who are learning the English language work for everybody. So it's another universally designed instructional strategy that we're putting in place. You may have heard it as sheltered instruction or SIOP. That's another way we refer to that. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, active and engaged instruction. So this is about modern learning, everybody. You know, here we are. Students have access to a lot of information. So our jobs have changed as educators. The access they have is different. So this is really about designing a modern learning system that meets the needs of students. Um, so we're excited about that. We have some uh, really wise instructional technology consultants who work with us and pathways for professional learning that address that. So imagine you're a teacher and all four of these squares are really important and you just came from an SEL presentation where we also talked about the importance of teachers being trauma-informed, right? And all the other elements that a teacher has to hold and be successful in and be trained in and do to support students in their classrooms. And it's a heck of a lot, isn't it? It's an awful lot. So what we try to do is to maintain a focus and to reduce the load on our teachers so that they can have the capacity to learn and implement and apply uh, and not have too much on their plates. So it's really tough in this time when so much need is, is at our doorstep, but um, they're an incredible team. So thanks again to our teachers. We'll move on. So we're gonna talk about equity-centered staff development. And I'm going to hand this off to my partner, Kevin Carr. Good evening, trustees. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight, Dr. Swift. Um, so as we talked, as you think about that last slide that we just had, culturally affirming instruction, this is in direct connection to that aspect of the framework. And so when we look at this part of it, we're going to go back a couple of years and we're going to talk a little bit about the work that we did beginning in 21-22. Uh, and we began a series of professional learning uh, sessions connected to culturally affirming instruction. It, we worked first with Dr. Yolanda Celia Ruiz, top on the screen. Um, uh, Dr. Celia Ruiz is a poet and an award-winning professor of English uh, education at Teachers College at Columbia University. Um, a literacy educator for over two decades, Dr. Celia Ruiz worked with all Ann Arbor Public Schools teachers in 21-22, focusing on race, culturally responsive pedagogy, and the power of love in ed education. Concurrently, Dr. Chris Emden, bottom on the screen, is the chair of uh, curriculum theory and, and professor of education at the University of Southern California, where he also serves as the director of youth engagement and community partnerships. Dr. Emden, worked with all of our uh, leaders, our administrator, administrators, focusing on the impact of beliefs and habits uh, and the shared responsibility of the learning community to remove barriers to learning. So 
Those were two things that happened as we were leaving COVID and were important mindset uh, opportunities for all of us to be thinking about how do we end up changing what it is we're doing so that we end up aligning our work with the needs of the students and the families that we serve. As a, as a connect the dots, this year we kicked off the year with uh, top left Cornelius Minor. And um, that was a great moment for us because in that part of it, we're working to take the learning of the previous year and then think about, well, what can we actually do to impact and change our teaching and learning? Um, and that was guided by that keynote's uh, address from Cornelius Minor. He is the author of We Got This, Equity, Access, and the Quest to Be Who Our Students Need Us to Be. Um, Mr. Minor works with, uh, he works internationally with educators, and his work guided AAPS teachers and leaders this year to explore how to create more equitable school spaces in, a, uh, in embedded and everyday choices, specifically uh, in the choice of to really listen to students and hear them so that we can make different choices and modify our instruction. Um, and so that was, that's been an ongoing work throughout this year. And then, of course, we've also been engaging with belonging through a culture of dignity. And so developing that culture and dignity throughout the Ann Arbor public school systems. And that's been a leader-focused uh, part of our work this year. The practice of teaching and learning networks came into play at the beginning of COVID for us because we recognized that our teachers needed a support system and they needed to have the space and the time to be able to connect uh, and share great practice and, and great ideas with each other. So we created the TLNs as a way for teachers to connect and network, um, and it was really successful. And they are by teachers for teachers. So these are groups that have teacher leaders leading, um, sharing their best practice, and they're a really powerful flywheel of support um, that we put in place. This past year, those TLNs, which during COVID used to be district level, very large teams, shifted to building level teams. And so those building TLNs have been working in the Cornelius Minor work all year to apply what they are thinking about and reading about together, setting their own goals and thinking about how that looks in their departments, in their content areas, in their grade levels. And so just uh, this week on May 2nd, they had their first equity expo where they shared their practice with each other um, and it was highly successful. So we're gathering that information and we look forward to bringing some of those highlights to you very soon. Uh, but those teaching and learning networks and building TLNs, those will continue. They're a real part of our heart. And you can see here some of the ways that that those teams exercise their connections with each other. And we're going to talk a little bit about the curriculum and instruction moves that are happening um, in our academic recovery. So we'll keep on rocking to slide 11. And we're going to begin here with Kristen, who's going to share with us a little bit in this red column, and we'll move through each of these elements. This is really the overview of recovery work in the Ann Arbor Public Schools. It's a very high-level summary. You're not going to see a lot of detail here, but we'll, we'll break it down just a little bit in the following slides. Kristen Smith, our District ELA and Social Studies Coordinator. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. It's nice to be here with all of you. Um, and I'm going to get us started by just giving sort of an overview of um, our intervention and intervention specialists. So we currently have 21 literacy specialists in the Ann Arbor Public Schools, and we have one per elementary building. We also have six math specialists, um, and they represent seven of our buildings. In this role as specialist, there is a great deal of focus on supporting our teachers with tier one instructional practices. And so examples of this may include um, supporting new curriculum, helping teachers to develop small group structures, interpreting data to design small group or instructional sequences. And then the other role of our specialists is to provide tier two um, and sometimes tier three interventions to students who qualify based on the assessment data that we review. Um. Good evening, everyone. I will speak a little bit to the gold column here. Um, in this column for elementary, what we're looking at here is really targeted intervention that is based on student need and their development towards their grade level expectations. So this is something that's taking place in the buildings and being monitored by 
by our specialists, um, in addition to other supports that are available in the buildings. Um, and then they make use of additional assessments beyond what's being used in the classroom or in addition to what's being used in the classroom at, at a finer, more fine-tuned level um, to hone in on some skills that really do need to be addressed and to help bring those students to that grade level expectation. Thank you, Tony. Tony is our math coordinator, math and science coordinator for elementary. Appreciate that. Uh, Huda Harajli is going to share a little bit about this next column, our English learner column. Good evening, trustees and Ann Arbor community. I'm delighted to share with you the latest and greatest in the world of Ann Arbor EL. Currently, we proudly serve 1,800 English learners, the most ever in our district's history. In addition, we have 600 FELs, former ELs, that we monitor and support regularly. We have 27 EL teachers. They are exceptional and dedicated among the best in the state and nation. Um, 18 of them work at the elementary level and nine work at the secondary level. Also, we have six newcomer co-teachers who are grant funded through the state of Michigan or uh, federal funds, and they work with our recently arrived students. They are highly qualified EL educators with a master's degree in ESL education. In addition, our 45 bilingual liaisons work with directly with families to help transition families to Ann Arbor Public Schools and schooling in the United States. And last but not least, our highly qualified EL instructional assistant clock in over 4,000 hours of additional supplemental support for our English learners K-12. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Hada. I have a quick, In addition to the work that, that Huda okay. leads, she she also provides professional development and learning for our general education staff all across the district. So it's really an important role. And finally, in this last column, the teal column, we'll talk a little bit about the, the supports beyond the school day. It's not enough in a recovery plan to, to count on only the time we have together with students that six and a half hours a day. So we've got a wraparound system that um, provides really a 12-month process for students through our extended summer programs. And we talked a lot about those uh, not too long ago when we were together. In addition, 24 access to resources, skills, tool, skills-based tools that students can access through uh, Lexi, Alexia Power Up, Dreambox. Um, those pieces are really important to us, and we really appreciate the support of our board in, in approving those. And finally, um, how we intervene when students are in academic distress at the secondary level through credit recovery. That happens through the moment of failure. So as we're seeing students start to be unsuccessful in those courses, and it looks like they may not gain credit, we don't wait for that to happen and then send them to summer school. We begin that recovery process during the course of the school year so that they can get caught up and still earn credit. And another important element of our online course access um, for additional supports or to retake, those pieces are available grades five through 12. Um, so those continue. It's pretty robust. So we'll move on to slide 12 and I'm gonna hand this back to Kristen Smith and she's gonna talk us through the next few slides. Thanks, Kristen. You're welcome. Um, really, the heart of our elementary classrooms is the daily small group instruction that teachers provide for both literacy and math. Um, one really important thing that we do to determine what student needs are, and specifically those students who might need additional support, um, is the use of universal screeners. Um, we also use a variety of formative or sometimes called diagnostic assessments that we can then um, use to really dig deeper into student strengths and the needs that they might have. A little later in the presentation, we'll give you some examples of what those assessments might look like. Um, by digging deeper and using these formative assessments, we really um, can help teachers plan for small group instruction. And we wanna think about small group, small group instruction as extra support. Um, for the tier one curriculum, but also for enrichment beyond that tier one curriculum. In order to really make space and time for small group instruction, one key instructional shift that we made this year in our kindergarten through second grades um, was to shift more instructional minutes into the word study block. 
um, in order to really provide time and support for students in those foundational reading skills of phonemic awareness and phonics. Um, one other important thing to note about daily small group instruction in our classrooms is that these groups are always fluid and based on need and the strategies that students are working on rather than a specific reading or math level. In particular, we know that the development of skilled reading is an extremely complex process. So we know that reading remediation or intervention, um, or I'm sorry, reading remediation at an earlier age is much more effective than intervention. This is why it's so essential for us to screen um, and then use those diagnostic assessments to better understand student needs. Um, we know and often say that struggling readers do not have time for a wait and see approach. We need to be proactive. Um, the, the assessments that we use when we're looking at our readers are meant to focus on um, the following components of reading. So those would be phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, comprehension, fluency, and writing. I mentioned a few moments ago that teachers have many different formative assessments at their fingertips that they can use to really dig into the needs of their students and to learn more about them. Um, so this is just kind of a look at one of the menus that is available to them. Um, but the two things that I would like to point out here is just that variety of assessments that are provided, um, but also that it's really important for us to consider before administering an assessment, what kind of information we might be looking for so that we can choose the correct one. Um, by having this information, we're then able to plan um, that focused instruction that will benefit um, all of the readers in our classrooms. So here's an example of a formative assessment that we use um, to help us determine specific areas of need within the area of phonemic awareness. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Emily, who is one of our building literacy coaches at Abbott Elementary. And she's just going to share a little bit about um, what a teacher or a instructional specialist might do with the results of an assessment like this. Thanks, Kristen. Hi, everyone. Nice to be there virtually today. Um, when I use a screener like this, a phonemic awareness tool, I'll work with a student to administer the screener, um, usually at the beginning of the year. And then I can share that information with teachers to help them identify specific goals that they'll work on with that student. Um, I can also work with that student in intervention and progress monitor those goals at the same time that teachers are progress monitoring their goals because we have this um, common tool to share with each other. And it also creates a common language for us to establish when we're working on specific goals with students. Um, so these tools are really helpful. Thank you very much. And Tony's going to come in here and share a few slides around our math work and how we diagnose and screen and intervene and support with mathematics. Tony Stam. Thank you. Yes. Um, so we're we're really at a point where in math we're we're dialing in much closer to where literacy is and ha is is going as well to be able to identify this early intervention. We understand and know that math builds on itself from year to year. Um, but a lot of times those um, those gaps or those those areas don't expose themselves until later on in the upper grades. And so we really want to identify this earlier. Um, and so we're looking at things as I have here on the screen of counting comp uh, concrete objects, comparing numbers, early basic addition and subtraction in order to set up kind of those next three steps that are on the screen there. Um, so we we work on whether it's one-on-one -on -one correlation, forward number word sequence, can the students count forwards, can they count backwards, can they ID their numbers, um, and then some early arithmetic as well. Um, and so that's where we're working um, and to better identify students um, where those gaps may occur early on so that way we are not getting into the upper grades and then realizing that there's some things back in the lower grades that we need to address that allow them to gain. So um, that's what we're, where we're working on with math. And then you'll see on the next slide here, um, kind of the way we're starting to build this out and utilize um, the things that we have access to. So 
All of our students, as we know in the district, are utilizing the NWEA uh, math assessment. Um, it's it serves as a bit of a screener. Um, it's it's we're able to identify some students. Um, the specialists in around the district are, are fine tuning that and making sure we're making the best decisions that we can. And um, Natalie is one of those um, who could comment on that as well. Um, we have our unit assessments, which are given by classroom teachers. And so that's progress monitoring like unit by unit basis, which allow for conversations and, and opportunities for the specialists in between teachers um, to cap like what's going on and how can we adjust our groups, um, make those, those um, in time changes as we need. And as we ratchet up where we want to monitor that growth, one of the tools we have that's been mentioned is Dreambox. Uh, we're utilizing that. You can see all the, the staff who have access to that. Um, and that's allowing both students that, uh, that need to address and fill some gaps, but also that helps for students who can go beyond. So if we've identified some things and through NWEA or unit assessments and the teachers can provide additional material um, through the support of Dreambox, they're able to go in advance as well on the other end. Um, but where we're really spending a lot of our time right now is in these individual assessments um, that we'll, we'll talk to next and I'll, I'll uh, have Natalie speak to those a little bit more. But um, we really, once we've identified students that are not making the gains as we would expect, we then want to diagnose sim uh, similar to what Kristen was speaking about, um, of where is, their, where is that student's mathematical understanding and how do we have to fine tune our instruction to make sure to help them continue to grow on that path. But we're learning and seeing those there's very clear trajectories that students must move through levels or constructs we refer to them as and as they make growth through those we they're going to progress to the higher levels of mathematics and so if they're stuck at any one of those levels um we have some training and support and some uh assessments and resources to help continue to move students up through that and that's one area that's not only the specials but a lot of our classroom teachers i think somewhere in the neighborhood of about 60 um, have begun to engage in the training where that's just taking place within the classroom uh, these are three examples that we've pulled um, or just just kind of a front screener to give you an idea um, about these assessments to see how the, they're attached to learning numbers and, and a learning framework and number, which the students all progress through. We've seen multiple videos. This is used across the nation and, and um, multiple nations. So we're seeing it uh, really utilized and it's it's very consistent regardless of of how it's be, of of where it's being utilized. So, Natalie, do you want to add anything to this one before we move to the next slide? Um, I guess I could. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, I would just add that um, what's great about these assessments is they're very targeted. Um, it allows us to understand a child's developmental process, where they are in their brain development, uh, and what they're ready for next. So we have everything from number words and sequences. <laughs> Do they, again, as Tony said, count forwards and backwards? Can they start from any number, um, which would be important if you're trying to use a count on strategy. You can't do um, eight plus six and go eight, nine, 10, 11 if you don't know that nine comes after eight right away. Um, as one example, uh, we look at structuring. Structuring is a, a way that we get to the basic addition and subtraction facts and without counting by ones. Um, if, if the longer students rely on counting by ones, the, and they move into upper grades, we tend to lose them as math students. So we need to get them to structure and to, to understand those systems and the way the best base 10 system works so that they are able to use composite strategies, um, higher thinking skill strategies that will help them to move forward in advanced math. Um, the final thing that we're looking at in, on this particular screen is looking at a child's development. Um, are they able to work with a bare number? If you're looking at the numeral, the squiggle that is a five, do they understand that that is it contains the four, the three, the two, the one within that um, as a way to think about it? So these these assessments really help us hone in exactly where a child is developmentally, um, and then they we can use that information to really target their instruction both at level tier one um, in the classroom and at tier two if they need a little extra support and intervention. 
So here on this slide, it's just a, it's just an example. It's not meant to be read. Um, there's a lot of information, a lot of data there. Um, but this is one example of a kind of a screenshot um, from from one of the schools, actually from this uh, Logan where Natalie is at. Where this is how the specialists and the other folks in the building who are maintaining this data. This is how, one way that they're they're kind of capturing the story of each student and monitoring that progress over time. Um, and really showing how they're taking detailed notes where people can catch, you know, get the information, see where the child is at and how to move them forward. Um, real, real targeted on the ground, real time information um, is kind of what you see here. Um, Natalie, would you like to add anything about how you're using how you're using this or how it's beneficial to your work? Yes, this is our data hub, and it's incredibly beneficial to our work. We have um, quite a bit of data on, this, on the screen you're looking at. It's mostly the ELA data, but every student is followed, um, and their progress progress from the time they enter Ann Arbor schools or Logan anyway until they leave. Uh, we continue to keep this data, this this document updated for every student. So in it, they'll see in the ELA world um, the results of those screeners and assessments that they've they've taken. Um, in the math world, if I've done an assessment on them, that data would be in here. We'll also see their NWA scores, their MSTEP, that sort of thing as well, and just across all of their years. So it's really helpful to sort of see where a child's been, where they've made some gains. We color code it so we can kind of at a glance see where they are. Um, and that just kind of helps us stay on top of every kid, make sure they're getting what they need exactly. Thank you. I think we're turning this back over to Emily to, to talk about the slide here. Yes, thanks, Tony. Um, here we are at Abbott and Ba having some reading intervention classes. So these are when specialists, reading interventionists like myself, um, use research supported curricula and materials to support students um, with foundational reading skills. And so what you can see in these pictures um, are me and my favorite colleague, Star, the therapy dog, who's also a very fluent and proficient reader at this point. Um, using decodable text with our readers. Um, these are highly engaging books that our students feel confident applying strategies within. Um, we're also practicing dictated sentence writing, which is another skill that reinforces um, encoding, which is spelling words and sounds, um, which is also foundationally important for student success in later years. Um, and my colleague, Jenny Miller, who's featured in the middle picture on the screen is using um, a program called, from UFLY, um, which is the University of Florida um, Literacy Institute. And she's leading students to segment and blend the sounds that they hear in words, which is also um, foundationally important when students are learning to decode words or read words. Um, so I just love all these pictures. <laughs> And then um, here you'll see students at STEAM and ANGEL um, who are le learning um, letter sounds. And so, as we know, a lot of students who are learning to read are first learning um, the sounds that letters spell. And so this is one of the first skills that we start with after cementing some of those phonemic awareness skills that we practice where we're listening for sounds and parts of words. Um, then we'll move on to looking and recognizing print or the letter sounds that students see. So um, here we see some math intervention happening at uh, Carpenter and at Logan. That is my colleague, Siobhan Watson, on the far left there. She's at Carpenter. Um, and she is instructing students with a tool we call number tracks. That is to help kids practice a sequence of numbers. In that case, it looks like they're working on the 30 family. Um, that's a picture of me in the middle there with uh, Emerson and, and uh, Kaylee. And we are working with some tools, some little different manipulatives that we can use to, um, well, through, okay, so this, this intervention we're working with is the Advantage Math Recovery, or AVMR for short. Um, so it's that research-based, very prescribed, um, very targeted intervention. That's also what Tony's using up in, in his two pictures on the right with his students at Logan. Um, we're working in those three general areas, the number of words and sequences, structuring, that would be basic facts, um, and then um, counting sequences and uh, con conceptual place value. So we would work with kids either one on one and you know for intense intervention. Uh, we could also work with a small group as Siobhan is doing there. 
Oh, and we also use games. Sorry, I should throw that in there. Games are very, very, very important in math intervention and math classes in general. We're working on bringing more of those real life experiences that are relevant to kids. They really care about playing a game. They're invested in it. So we tried to bring, we're trying to bring more of that into our, our instruction, our regular tier one instruction as well. That's great. Um, so those photos and much of the information we shared on the previous slides help to really show um, the role of the specialist in terms of that direct student intervention that they provide. We also know that the specialists um, work to build the capacity of teachers. Um, supporting teachers and the improvement of tier one instruction is a central part of that role as a specialist. The impact of improved tier one instruction for all students far outweighs the impact of intervention for a small number of students. Um, so as we often say or hear, you can't intervene your way out of a tier one problem. Um, so hopefully we've been able to show you what those two um, really important roles of the specialists are within our buildings. Thank you very much, Kristen, Tony, Natalie, and Emily. Um, we're gonna roll through the, the last slides pretty quickly. They're an overview of how we continue to help students recover. We're always looking at the scope and sequence, so we never want students on mass to be promoted and begin in a place they're not ready for. So there's that constant revamping of the scope and sequence to make sure that we're not producing gaps, that we're addressing them. Um, we also want to make sure that the learning and the curricula is visible and accessible. So I don't want to miss an opportunity to talk about tools like Snap and Read, CoWriter and Read and Write, which are available to 100% of our students through their Chromebooks. Anytime they're reading, anytime they're working on something, um, they can simply click on those icons. Tools will help them by reading words to them, helping them highlight, underline, and access. So it's powerful. And of course, uh, we don't want to miss talking about Schoology and Sora and the ways that we are improving the ways students learn and engage through discourse. So we'll talk a little more about those tools in the middle school presentation. We'll keep on rocking. We already talked about credit recovery. This is just a quick slide to show some examples of how that looks, small group and individualized. All of the credit recovery is individualized. In some districts, we know that students retake an entire course for recovery. That doesn't happen here in credit recovery. Students are addressing the gaps, the things that they didn't master during the course, and then they earn their credits. So it's a far more meaningful and effective process. It's also pretty engaging for kids. So I just want to recognize Mike Summerton, who has led that effort in our district for the last several years and very successfully. And then we'll rock forward. So we talked about the partnerships in the village. Um, this is a really important public address <laughs> announcement. Uh, just a reminder to families that there are there is access through the Clever login to all of these tools. You will find Power Up, Dreambox, Sora, Lexia, um, all accessible to students. And we've got just a few of them listed here, including monitoring how students are doing in Schoology and monitoring the books they're reading in Sora. And on the next slide, we'll talk about um, just a little more in depth, some of these in the middle school program, but this is just to show you all throughout K-5, grade six and up, uh, the 24 seven tools that students have access to. So Dreambox, Lexia, Lexia, Power Up, and as an intervention, grade six and up, Delta Math RTI, which is teacher driven, and then student practice uh, that follows. And then we'll really quickly, Andrew, go through these. Um, my partner, Kevin Carr, is going to talk a little bit about summer, just a quick overview, because we did a presentation on these. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah of course, we've got a, a wide range of summer programs available again this year. Um, we address elementary, middle, high school. We've got special programming just for our English learners, special education programming, and the ever popular AAPS summer music program. I didn't want to steal your slide, Kevin. I know we're, we're speeding up here. Um, this is for those uh, who don't know how to access. It's so easy. Step one, you go to clever.com. You can also log in with your student's Clever badge in lower elementary. Next slide shows you step two. You click log in as a student, go to step three, and you click on the icon and you're in. That's how easy it is to access these tools. So we'll continue to support our families and students in accessing them, and we do monitor that data to see uh, outside of school hours whether students are using them, and they are. 
Um, so at this point, I think we'll take you to some next steps. Um, we talked about the framework. We're going to continue professional learning in building capacity of staff, but doing that at a pace that is viable, that is human uh, for our teachers who have an awful lot on their plates. Um, and also on the student effective practices side, you heard Bill Harris talk a little bit about multi-tiered systems of support. Um, that, that is the focus of our district improvement plan and our district improvement work that fits squarely in the buckets of our strategic equity plan and what we're going out to listen and learn about. So we're, we're pretty excited about that clear focus and alignment that's coming your way. But we're going to continue to monitor and invest. And as I said in the beginning, we're never done. So thank you. I know it's late. We really appreciate this opportunity to go through that with you. Okay. So thank you so much for that presentation. It was, it was really good. Um, thank you. Thank you, team. Thank you, remote team. Great yes. job. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And thank you in person, team.